Amen, amen, amen. Can we give God just one big hand, all of our guests, the guests that are online? All right, so I've been in a series over in Lafayette, and um, I make it easy on myself, and I try to always figure out what I'm teaching and how to figure it out and work it into what Dad is teaching over here, and uh, that I did it. So um, I was able to fit what I taught last week uh, at, in, in Lafayette into over here, and I think, um, I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be good. And the reason why I wanted to read my story um, was because I want to talk to you about the process of how God moved in my life. So what you don't know, I don't know, I don't know if that was actually in my story, I can't remember exactly what I said at the front, but I struggled with that addiction for not just a couple of years, not just 10 years, but like 20 years that I struggled. And I would stop for a few months and I'd be back in, I'd stop for a few months and I'd be back in. Never got caught, never once got caught. Isn't that crazy? which should tell you that I got really good at hiding stuff. So don't ever play hide and seek with me is what I'm trying to tell you. I'm good. <laughs> but um, I never got caught. I went and told Brittany, which I'm not telling you that's the wisest decision as a man. If you're struggling, you might want to start with somebody else. <laughs> and then work your way to talking. I told my wife over uh, a Super Bowl party that we were getting ready for as I was cooking wings out. And, and uh, yeah, 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 and having people from the church over. Uh, and I'm telling my wife, hey, babe, I, didn't, I just want you to know something. I've struggled with porn for 20 years, you know, and, and I'm kind of making a joke of it now. It was not a joke then. And I just started the process, though. I didn't tell her everything. I just started the process of I need help. I got things out of order. My life is out of order. And I was smart enough as a really kind of dumb guy to realize that if I didn't make a change, I was gonna lose everything. Most importantly, my wife and my family. But right after that would be my ministry and what God's called me to do. And I just knew that if I didn't make a shift, if I didn't start to get things in order, I was headed for trouble, big trouble. And I just want to talk with you about what I feel like God used in my life to get things back in order. You say, John, I didn't have a porn addiction. Okay, fine. I bet you there's people in here that do, whether we want to admit it or not. Because statistically, from what I know, even in the church world, like I think it's up to like 60 to 70 percent of men and women in the church world struggle with this. Come on. I'm going to have you stand real quick if you start. No, I'm totally kidding. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but may, may, maybe that's not you. Maybe it's, maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's alcohol. Uh, maybe, maybe it's food. Maybe it's TV. Maybe it's games. Maybe it's... That's, that's what we like to consider the big ones. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's whatever other way you find to numb out. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Okay. So just stick with me because we can get things out of order. And I want to take the message I talked last week and talk to you about it here. But you got to be humble. I got to be humble. And it starts with this. I want you to look at your neighbor straight in the face, right in the face. If you don't know him, this is going to get awkward. But look at him <laughs> straight in the face, and I want you to say this, I'm a big hypocrite. Let them know. Now, I didn't tell you to tell them they're a hypocrite. You might get popped. <laughs> but I'm a big hypocrite. Welcome to Life Church. We are a friendly, hospi hospitable, life-giving church, but you're a big hypocrite. Just so you know, before you leave, you say, John, I'm, oh, come on, I'm no hypocrite. Ah, just hang on a second. And I think there's levels. I think some of us, you know, can fall into hypocrisy. Some of us just live there. 
like we're just cool just living a hypocritical life. But here's a couple of things that you can ask yourself this morning, see if you fall into this category. And the first thing about a hypocrite is I live by a definition I have not learned. I live by a definition that I have not learned. Paul says in Romans seven fifteen, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do, I end up doing. So even Paul struggled with this thing of having things in his life that he said he didn't want to do that he ended up doing and things that he know he shouldn't be doing, come on, or he should be doing, he wasn't doing. And let me just ask you a question. Have you ever told anybody anything that you didn't do yourself? Like lie. Come on. How many have ever said, kids, it's not good to lie? How many have ever told your kids not to lie? And then when that phone rings, or uh, not even so much anymore because we got all these cell phones, but uh, when the home phone used to ring, I'm not here. <laughs> what do you want me to tell them? I'm not here. <laughs> Come on. So we, we talk from something we have not learned. And then number two, we take a position that we have not earned. Matthew 7, 3 and 5 says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your eye? Listen to this, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brothers. What, what's he saying? Because some of us will argue back and forth. Well, we're not supposed to judge. Ah, debatable. Debatable. We, 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 there is a level of us judging one another. But what God is saying, the heart of it is what matters. It's all about the posture of our heart to God. It is okay for me to, to judge someone's intentions or where someone's at, but here's the thing he asked me to do first, to make sure my heart is good with how I'm approaching how that person is, hey, get the, the walnut tree skip out of my own eye. Then I'll come talk to you about the toothpick in yours. Come on, somebody. It's a heart posture. It's a grace approach. Not, I've earned this, I'm at this level, you're way down here. That'll preach, huh? And then number three, I have a condition that I have not turned. These are not probably on the screen. This is two weeks ago's message. I'm just trying to get y'all caught up, man. Y'all gotta go fast. So I, have a def I live by a definition that I have not learned. So I say one thing, do another. I take a position that I have not earned. I try to tell somebody else something that I haven't even got to myself. And then I have a condition that I have it turned. We all have something in our lives that we still, to this day, have not turned over to Jesus. All of us. Not me. Hmm. Matthew 4, 16 says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Who began to preach? Who was it? It was Jesus. Jesus began to preach, Repent, there's that, there's that Christian cuss word. We, hate, we, we don't like that word in church. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You know, who Jesus was really talking about when he was approaching hypocrisy was a bunch of church folks, a bunch of religious folks. It's this group of guys called Pharisees. And I, I believe there were around like 600 Pharisees at one time. Now, not all of them were, were bad. All of them, not, not all of them uh, probably lived a, a life of full hypocrisy, but a lot of them did. And Jesus 
felt like he needed to approach this so much that he gave him like seven or eight woes. Like, whoa, buddy. Like, and I'm serious. I wonder if that's how G, like, whoa. Wait a second here. Whoa. Like, clean the cup on the inside before you start trying to act like you're clean on the outside. He's talking to these people, and he's like, dude, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites, man. You say this, you do that, you hold people to a level you're not even at yourself, and you still have things that you haven't turned over to me while trying to tell everybody else how to live their life. Matthew 15, 7, 9, this was prophesied all the way back in the Old Testament. It says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. In other words, you sing these songs, you raise your hands, you show up to church every Sunday, you serve every Sunday, you look really nice on the outside. But Monday through Saturday looks way different. This is good preaching, John. They need to hear this, John. You be brave. Come on, somebody. And again, Jesus would go on to give like seven woes. Whoa! The title of my message today is it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. When you're out of order, it's a heart issue. It's not a sin issue. It's not a spouse issue. It's not a kid issue. Come on. It's not a finance issue. It's a heart issue. Hypocrite comes from the Greek word, like I think it's like hypocrites. That's how you say it, which means an actor, an actor. And I wanted to be, make sure I was racially correct in this church. So I got three different colors so nobody would get on to me. But we love wearing these, don't we? We even show up to church with these bad boys on. I did for years. For years, I showed up with these on. We all do it. How you doing today? Oh, doing great. Doing amazing. Really? Yeah, man. Too blessed to even be stressed. <laughs> well, all the time, I'm, I'm struggling. My marriage is jacked up. My relationships are jacked up. Come on. How you doing? Too blessed to be stressed. Too anointed to be disappointed. <laughs> That's how we do it. Some of us would put Denzel Washington to shame with how good we act. In a place that we should be able to just drop these bad boys, we still... How are we ever going to find freedom when we don't even know who we are half the time? You know what I found out about the mask that I wore? I started to discover it made me feel like a superhero. And not because I had special powers, but because I was able to hide who I really was. Right. And any great superhero wear the mask, why? Because they don't want nobody to discover who they really are. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how pathetic the church has got over the years. Not this church, because I honestly think we fight for this to be less the more we move forward, but how pathetic the big C church has got where we have to show up with these on yeah. Yeah. instead of saying, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. See, some of us have given our lives to Jesus and allowed him to do a work on the inside of us and start to change us from the inside out, and we honestly do a pretty good job with what we preach. We do a pretty good job of practicing what we preach. I'm looking around this auditorium at people that helped raise me 
I mean, I've watched them walk out their relationship with Jesus. And outside of my mom, I don't think anybody else in here is perfect, but she's probably the closest. Come on, somebody. (laughs) But I've watched all these people just lead amazing lives of Jesus. But be careful. Be careful. Because you can fall into hypocrisy too. And look at this, Luke 18, 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like those other people, those robbers, those evildoers, those adulterers. Let me, let me J. Neal, paraphrase it. Those people who don't look like me, act like me, dress like me, walk like me, talk like me, smell like me, act like me. Thank you that I'm not like them. That's what this guy's saying. Be careful. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I've got. But the tax collector stood at a distance and he would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his chest, he beat his breast. Boy, I've been there. And said, God, have mercy on me because I'm a sinner. I tell you, this man is what Jesus said. This man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Not the man who was doing all these great deeds and thought that his poop didn't stink. Sorry. But the one that was willing to fall on his knees and admit, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's one category you can fall into. The second one is some of, us, some of us have given our heart to God and we're learning to let him be Lord of our lives. We just have some masks that we're having a hard time letting go. We may live a hypocritical life, but we don't really want to. We just don't know who to turn to. We've given our hearts to Jesus but we're really having a hard time letting go of some of these masks that we've wore our whole lives. Can we please not be a church that pushes these people away? God did not come into the world to condemn this world, but all those that believe in him. Come on, somebody. That condemning is not okaying our actions. I'm gonna talk about that here in a second. That condemning is not okaying our actions. God, when God said that, he sent his son not to condemn. It means that he didn't come to beat us up, folks. He didn't come to kick us out the church. He didn't come to shame us and to guilt us into living for him. He came to give us space, this thing called grace, to get to know him. That's why sinners wanted to be around him. That's why sinners, why bad people were drawn to him. Why? Because they didn't feel condemnation. They were actually welcomed in. And they left different because he spoke truth. We're gonna get to that in a second. Some people are trying. Come on. Ask yourself that question. How long have you been wearing that mask? How long? Maybe today is a day where you start to lay it down. And the third one is that there's some people in the room that just don't care. They live a hypocritical life and have no plan on changing it. They say they love Jesus with their lips, but the way that they choose to live their lives doesn't match up with the way that God has commanded us to live. They say it with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. Oh, I've been there. I've been all three of these, actually. And I think we can find ourselves in that third one over time because we continue in our sin, we continue in our mask, and we just, the conviction of the Holy Spirit has just become numb to us. Scripture talks about that. I think also it's because we're happy with the way of living. 
and we don't want to lay it down. It's not even that we don't agree with Jesus or his words. We're just happy with how it makes us feel and we don't want to lay it down. Come on, man. Am I the only dog in the room? Yeah. Man, we, that would get something started. We'd be the talk of town. If they bark at that church. I don't know what that's all about. Can you ask yourself, as I jump into this, that was just my introduction, I'm sorry, but we'll be done soon. <laughs> Can you ask yourself where you fall in those three? I bet you fall in one of those three. So if that's the case, then we got to ask ourselves, what do we do about it? When those overseers sat down with me, it's three of them. They knew me better than anybody. Right back here in that office. I got tricked into coming in. I thought it was a board meeting. There's only four of us in the room. I said, what the heck's going on? I figured it out pretty quickly. I felt betrayed by my dad, by my wife. I mean, I was a dog, and here I am mad at them. I left here, and I'd like to tell you that I left here with a repentant heart and God just ready to make all these changes for God, and I didn't. I walked out of here mad. I walked out of here ticked off. I jumped in my uh, infinity, my little two-door infinity, lit up a cigarette, drove home, went out into my shed where I smoked my cigarettes because I didn't want my kids to ever see me. Started smoking another cigarette in the shed and heard God speak to my heart. And I don't mean audibly, because I'm telling you, I told camp, my campus that I would have had to smoke the whole pack if God would have smoked audibly to me. <laughs> he literally asked me, he said, is this the direction you want to go? And I had to stop and think. I had to check my heart. It was a heart issue. Things were drastically out of order. So over time, none of this happened quickly. None of this happened overnight. But over time, God started to shift my heart and get things back into order. And the first thing that he showed me that I needed to do was that I, I needed to admit that I actually had a mask. Can I tell you that AA's got something right? When they say the first step is admitting that you have a problem. Because the first step that we need to do is, as, uh, even in, as a sinner, when we're coming into a relationship with Jesus, come on, somebody, what's the first thing we got to do? What do we got to admit? I got problems. And then we look up to heaven and we say, hey, I got these problems, but I know you have taken care of them. And I need a savior. So we got to admit it. But we, we don't just do that one time. Now, I truly believe that's all that's necessary. But I'm, I think the posture of our heart should stay at this, at this place where we are willing to go to our heavenly father and remove the mask. Let me tell you the only person you're not really a hypocrite to, Jesus. He already knows. He already knows all your junk. He knows all your dirty, dark, nasty things you don't want nobody else to know about. Come on, somebody. He already knows all of it. So you might as well go to him with a humble, broken heart that says, hey, Jesus, look, I'm struggling, but I'm removing the mask and I'm coming just as I am because I know that you accept, accept me just as I am. Come on, somebody. But we got to admit it. We got we to we be willing to go to his throne. And not this throne where he's there to condemn us and to beat us up and say, I can't believe you did it again, you dummy. When are you going to get over this? That's not the heart of our Father. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Listen to this. Let us then approach his throne with fear and trembling. 
Come on. Is that what it says? It could have said that. He could have said that. If that's what he wanted us to do, that's what would be in there. What's he say? Approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. You have not shocked God. He's unshockable. So you might as well approach his throne of grace with boldness and confidence. Not because you're right, but because, he, because you know he already sees you just as, he, that just as you are and still welcomes you to his throne of grace and mercy. That's a whole lot better than what you're acting right now. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So the first thing we got to do is admit it to our Heavenly Father. The second thing we got to do is we got to find somebody we trust to admit it to after that. Notice that we don't find the healing when we go to God and admit it. That's where we find our forgiveness. He, he added another step. Some of you have skipped the step and trying to go straight to him, and he's like, hey, you're missing a step. And this is the one as believers, we skip over. Because we're good with God knowing our junk, we're just not good with anybody else. Because we feel like we're gonna lose influence or whatever it may be. As you can tell, I don't care. You can know my junk. You get what you see. <laughs> you heard my story. Nothing happened immediately until I got completely honest with a lie detector test that I thought I was going to have to do with it. That'll make you be honest. Nothing immediately happened until I had a full disclosure of my sexual history with my wife. It was the scariest thing I had ever done in my life. I hurt the person outside of Jesus that I love the most. And I've told her this, and she, I know she understands my heart on what I mean by this. And at the same time, I am breaking the heart of someone who I never wanted to break the heart of. I am feeling the most weight lifted off me that I've ever felt in my entire life. Something broke when I got honest with her. The darkness was now in the light. Somebody knew the real me. As bad as it tore me up to hurt her. Selfishly, it was the best thing I've ever done in my life. Be careful who you tell. Be careful who you tell. You better have the right day that you're talking to. Don't just tell anybody. You'll blast that junk all over Facebook. I was so thankful for my wife who had every biblical reason to leave me, but yet chose to stay. And if, you, if she was up here on this stage, she would tell you she didn't choose to stay because I was amazing and so good looking, although I get it. That would be hard. And, be hard. <laughs> she chose to stay because I was finally being honest. Before you put number two up, I need you to prepare your heart because there's a cuss word in here. It's a Christian one, but there's a cuss word. And I need you to prepare your heart because this is the one we don't want to talk about in church no more. But this is really the main part of my whole talk. 
Second point is I got to repent and learn to walk in the freedom that God has for me. I got to repent. Once again, I'm sorry that the church, church world has destroyed that word because it's actually a very heavenly God kingdom word. God designed it. It's a beautiful word. Repenting is really just admitting that I have a way of doing things and living that's outside of the way of God's way of doing things and that I need to turn from my way of doing things a 180 towards him. See, the church world, though, has really blew this word um, into something it never should have been because we love to stand out on the street corners with picket signs, megaphones, and hateful messages on why you need to repent, which I would just challenge you that all of those people need to repent. That is, where do you, where do you see that in the heart of Jesus? Where? Well, he went into the church, he made that whip, and yeah, with church folks. I'm not talking about that kind of repent that hateful condemnation, shame and guilt type of a repent. I'm going to tell you right now, that never worked for me. I'm talking about a repent where I finally start to realize that I'm breaking the heart of my father who so desperately loves me and that my response back to him wants to be to do it his way. Say, John, is this biblical? Um, yes. <laughs> Sit back and enjoy the scriptures. Second Chronicles 7:14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Come on, USA, we could use this right now. Proverbs 28:13. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Second Chronicles 30 uh, verse 9, for the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He won't turn his face from you if you return to him. Second Peter 9 13, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to Repentance, we're not even close to done. Joel 2.13, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Ezekiel 18.32, for I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Mark 1.15, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent. Repent and believe the good news. Luke 5, 32, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to rep repentance. Can I get an amen from any sinner out there that's thankful for that? Acts 2, 38, people rep uh, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 51, 17, my sacrifice, O God, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, a repentive heart, in other words, God will not despise. Second Corinthians 7:10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Can I get an amen to all of those scriptures that makes it incredibly clear to each and every single one of us? That is not our sin that separates us from our heavenly father. It's the posture of our hearts. I believe we serve a God that is willing to work with anybody through anything. The only heart he ever has a hard time getting into is a prideful one. A hardened one that says, I'm doing this. I don't care. I would rather be happy. <laughs> hmm. 
somebody say, John, I thought this was one of those feel-good churches. It is. It is. <laughs> this will make you feel good. You're struggling to feel good because you're struggling doing this. We all struggle with maths, maths, folks, all of us. There's not a one of us in here that don't. Well, a sin's a sin. My friend, you could be no more right. I mean, that, that you are 150% correct, Skip. A sin is a sin. I've heard that so many times over this first start of this year. A sin's a sin, John. What's any different than that way or what? Okay, a sin is a sin, 100% correct. The difference is how comfortable I am living in that sin. The difference is my relationship with that sin. Come on, somebody. That's the difference. I'm going to say something very gracefully because I've been here. See, that's why I don't have a huge issue talking about this because I don't feel like there's any way that John Neal can approach this with a lot of shame and guilt and condemnation. You know why? Because I'm preaching to the choir. And I'm just gonna tell you, I would never in a million years wish my junk that I went through on anybody in this room, but I wouldn't trade it for the most money in the world because the reason why is I'm starting to realize that not only did God restore my life, Marta, and my wife's marriage and, and her personal life and my family's life where I'm able to talk to my boys about something that they ha we have no idea how much our kids have the opportunity to fall into this kind of stuff in the day and time that we live in. And I'm able to do that. But no, what I'm just starting to realize is that my actual story that is the most perverted thing ever, somehow God turned into his glory, and it points people back to him. Come on, somebody. Hebrews 10, 26, this verse will scare the hell out of you. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, there's no sacrifice for sins left. Uh-oh. That's not going on any of our coffee mugs. <laughs> we ain't selling that shirt out in the coffee shop. Come on. I mean, John, if I've deliberately sinned, there's no now. Hang on. I mean, I, okay, raise your hand. I'm raising both. If you want to raise, how many have sinned at least one time this month? Come on, raise your hands if you have. If you're not raising your hand, you're a liar, and you need to get your hands. <laughs> Okay, here, here's the next question. No, leave them up. Leave them up. I didn't tell you. Put them, leave them up. <laughs> How many have deliberately sinned in the last month? Where you knew what you were doing. You knew it was wrong. Okay, so it obviously doesn't mean that. Oh, we're all doomed. <laughs> it's a hard issue. It's a hard issue. It's a hard issue. If I'm just okay with it, I gotta check my heart. But as long as I have that repentive heart of returning to the throne, I will always find grace and mercy. True repentance leads a person to say, I've sinned. Repentance requires true brokenness. Repentance is not asking the Lord for forgiveness with the intent to just go out and sin again. Repentance is an honest, regretful acknowledgement of sin with a commitment to change. Repentance leads us to cultivate godliness without eradicating habits that lead into sin. Or while, sorry. Let me read that again because I confused all of you. Repentance leads us to cultivate godliness while eradicating habits that lead us to sin. I had a, fam, a couple that I met with this last Monday, and I'm going to be very careful because they are a huge part of my life. But we're having very hard conversations about a way that they live. And I've been willing to walk through it with them. I'm not going to shut the door in their face. 
I'm going to listen to the things that they send me over to listen to. And I'm going to try to be, be, do my best with guiding them through a very challenging situation that they're trying to wrestle through. But they asked me a question while I was sitting in, on a couch face to face. They said, John, do you think you can pray this out of us? And I said, no. I don't. Say, ye of little faith. No. Because I followed it up with, you know, God, God's a healer. I've seen the miraculous quite a few times in God's house. But I tell you, it's a higher percentage where people oftentimes don't find their healing on this side of heaven, but the next. Can I ask you a question, folks? Do you think I've ever been tempted to look at a computer screen again? I tried to pray it out a lot. Difference between now and then is I actually have gotten honest with the people that I need to be honest with in my life to help keep me accountable to the way that I know that God's asked me to do things so I don't return to a computer screen. But even if I did return to a computer screen, I know I've got a great group of people around me that I can go to and say, listen, I'm struggling. I've dropped it. Man, I hope this is okay. We got to hurry because I'm doing something and, and we ain't not doing it. So if you need to leave, you can leave. If you want to shut it off, shut it off. That's the beauty about being at home. I don't get to come over here very much, and I just feel like this is something that, I feel like this is where we're at in our world. And number three, rest in the love. Rest in his love for you. Rest in his love for you. Do you know that God actually disciplines the ones he loves? Scripture tells us that. That discipline actually brings us to repentance. It's a beautiful thing to have a repentive heart. Don't let the enemy shame you. Don't let him guilt you. Don't let him throw condemnation. Be very thankful that you have a repentive heart. That's actually a great sign. Come on, somebody. Romans 8, 35 through 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Thou trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't care how bad you think you are. You ain't that bad. It's a hard issue. You can go ahead and play. I need some help. I need some help. I want revival. I want revival, right? Some of you need to stop chasing revival and realize that it starts with you. Stop chasing it. I believe the best example of revival is a revived heart. Right here on the inside. Well, I'm willing to say, Jesus, 
whether I've been saved my whole life or I haven't even given my heart to God yet, but where I'm able to say, Jesus, I repent of the things that I am still missing in it. I turn to you. I come to your throne once again, and I set down. Some of you want revival. You have no idea what you're asking for. Some of you want to feel good. You can find that at a movie. Revival's not easy, or it happened all the time. You know why? Because it starts with a heart. It starts with a heart that says, okay, God, revive my heart. Wake my heart up again. Show me where I need to grow. Show me where I need to stretch. Show me where I need to love people better. Show me where I'm missing the mark. Like David, search my heart. Here's your opportunity. I'm not going to do a fresh start call. This is your fresh start call. I'm not going to do a thing where hey, if, you're, if you're, you know, struggling in sin or whatever, this is for anybody who says, hey, look, man, I, I'm wearing a mask and I'm done wearing it. I, I, I need to come to the throne of grace so I can receive his mercy. I'm not going to count to three. Not going to do any of that. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat, come down to this throne. If you need to kneel, if you need to stand, whatever you need, here's the altar. Here's where it starts. Here's where we start to drop, drop some of the mask. Here's where we start to say, Jesus, I need to get my life back in order with you. Here it is. Don't wait on somebody else. Here it is. Here it is. Be bold, my friend. Be bold. Be bold, my friend. Be bold. If you're a leader and you're sitting out there, you need to come pray. You need to come pray. Get your hands on these people. We ain't going to do nothing spooky. Don't worry about that. If you're already down here, we didn't trick you into nothing. Come on, come on, come on, man. Come on, can we say search my heart? Come on, can you say search my heart? Come on, search my heart, Father. Anything that's unclean, I'm asking you to get it out. Or the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. There's not shame, there's not judgment, there's not anger. There's freedom. Father, we thank you for your presence in this room. Come on, folks, cry out to him, would you? Father, we worship you, man. God, we approach your throne. Not with fear. Not with fear, not with trembling. God, we approach your throne with boldness and courage. And we say, God, we've dropped it again. We've let it down again. But man, we're approaching your throne with a repentant heart. To say, God, change me. Change me. Your way is better. Your way is better. <laughs> 